And it can move instantaneously against you without a moment's notice. It can. It often does. And um, so as I take you to Acts 12, I take you to a passage that is really tough, really hard on the early church. You've read it before. It's not particularly hard on you. But if you translate it into what's going on in your life now, now, it's not just hard on the early church. Sometimes life is hard on us. And in Acts 12, first verse, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. In other words, it was the Passover week. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people, which meant, which meant to finally kill him just like he did James. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. If you're a person who underlines in your Bible, you ought to consider verse 5. Not only that Peter's kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God for the church. Don't you hope that's true of you in your life? Especially in times of crisis and destruction and sadness and depression. Don't you hope the church makes earnest prayer for you? And I mean, the power of it is, although I'm sure you pray every day in some fashion, but the powerful proposition in this little verse is that they got together to do it. There was a, there was a fire started because the early church were so moved by what was happening in their church in Jerusalem. The death of the apostle James the imprisonment of the Apostle Peter, that they thought the world was coming apart at the seams. So we need to get together. We need to pray. Now listen, not take up arms. Not, not load your AK. Not make sure you had more bullets. Get before God. Keep that in mind. Here's the power of the church, to get before God. And so... I want to continue to read, but I'm going to stop at this moment because I want to take you, if you don't mind, up to the fact that the Spirit gathered the church to pray. And a couple of other folks from a distance were included in to this prayer meeting. This is a very important prayer meeting. That's why it's in the very middle of the book of Acts. In, uh, look at Acts 11. And uh, let's read in verse 19. Those who were scattered, we're talking about the early church now, because of the persecution that arose over Stephen. They'd already lost, you understand, Stephen, who was appointed uh, a deacon, one of, the, one of the deacons of the early church. And he was so powerful, so spiritually powerful, and so confrontational <laughs> with his fellow Jews in Jerusalem that the, uh, the gang of thugs known as the leadership of the Sanhedrin Council had targeted him. And so Stephen was killed, but so because of the persecution that arose out of that, they traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Very important to note, Antioch. It's Gentile Antioch. Speaking the word to no one except Jews. Well, after a while, they ran out of Jews in Antioch. And there was a spillover. It's amazing what happens when there is a spiritual spillover. <laughs> People are so in the Holy Spirit that they begin to get spilled over by the Spirit of God doing those things that normally their own culture would demand they not do. Right? So there were, in verse 20, there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also. In this case, the Hellenists are not Jews. They are Greek-speaking Gentiles. Preaching the Lord Jesus. Well, you see the spillover now. Uh-oh, we're in trouble now. 
people with blue eyes are beginning to hear what God has done in their life. And so he says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. My goodness, the Spirit of God was in the choice that the church in Jerusalem made to send a certain person into Antioch because maybe you don't know this at this moment, but according to Acts 14 and other passages, Barnabas had become an apostle in the early church, which meant in that day and time that he was there right on through the ministry of Jesus and saw him crucified and saw, saw the resurrection power and Barnabas is there. I'm, I'm quite sure the Spirit of God must have directed the early apostles in Jerusalem to send none other but Barnabas because he was known as someone who was a man of great power and encouragement. May you and I be known for those gifts. So, he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. He was a close friend of uh, Saul. You remember Saul, the rabid dog Pharisee Jew <laughs> who determined that his goal in life was to destroy the way, the early church, until, of course, Christ came and got him, knocked him off his horse, blinded him for three days, and he came to the Lord in that process. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called what? Christians. You know what that means, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. In other words, people who have chosen to follow after Jesus Christ. And in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Antioch was not down, it was up. But the way the Jews saw Jerusalem, it was high on, on a hill, seven hills. And uh, if you left Jerusalem, you were going down. <laughs> no matter where you were going, if you left Jerusalem, you were going down. And so prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them was named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. In other words, the emperor of Rome in that day, Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. In other words, to the church in Jerusalem. And they did so. Sending it to the elders by the hand of who? Aha. Uh -huh. The reason I'm reading this passage to you because in this gathering of the church to pray for Peter... God includes these two guys, Barnabas and Saul, to be a part of this prayer meeting. This is a very important event. The Gentile Antioch Church is formed right here in Acts 11. And at the midway point of Acts, it shifts. The history of the church moves from Jerusalem being the center to, of all things, Gentile Antioch being the center. And that's why from here on out, Acts is the history of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. <coughs> why go get Saul? <laughs> why go get Saul? Let me take you to Acts chapter 4. Acts 4. <clears throat> Look with me at, at um, let's start with verse 32. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. The word is koina, or koinonia. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Not only great power, but great grace was upon them all. Wouldn't it be nice to have a church full of that? <laughs> great power, 
great grace. Nobody's selfish. Everybody concerned about each other rather than themselves. Have you ever been in a church like that? This is, this is close. Thank you for saying that. I'll pay you after the service. So he says, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to each as any had need. And thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles, what? Barnabas. Barnabas. His name was Joseph. But he had a name change. Which means son of encouragement. The uh, bar, it's Hebrew. Bar means son. Nabas, actually meaning comfort or consolation. Because he was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, and he sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. I'm just kind of giving you some background on Barnabas because this is one of those important characters. When God moves upon people, there are certain characters that are very, very important in that movement. And oftentimes it doesn't move in the right direction unless that person takes up the, the goal, takes up the direction of the Lord. And Barnabas fits in those shoes because he is, after all, a son of encouragement, a son of comfort. Let me show you how much. Uh, go with me to Acts chapter 9. Well, I told you you were going to have to keep the book of Acts in front of you. Acts chapter 9. And Acts 9 is very famous for the conversion of Saul. You know, this mad dog fellow who was determined to destroy whoever he could. He, he manufactured the charges against Stephen. Was there when they stoned him to death. Paul, all his life long, saw himself as a murderer because he had persecuted the church in many ways, but especially because he was, had manufactured the, the death, the murder of Stephen. So the first part of Acts 9 is all about his conversion. You all know that story, don't you? On his way to Damascus, still mad as a mad hatter, still determined to do Satan's bidding until he meets Jesus. Just knocked off his horse, blind for three days. And God does this for Saul. He sends a man named Ananias, who didn't particularly want to go because he'd already heard about Saul, as everybody had. He's blind. He's foaming at the mouth. He's weak. He's not eating. Good, leave him there. But that wasn't God's intention. So he sends Ananias. In case you're wondering about that, why Ananias? It's the church. <laughs> Most people don't get where they need to be spiritually without the church. Did you know that? I, I've heard the same nonsense talk all my life about how, you know, I don't go to church, it's full of hypocrites. I don't go to church because of preachers. I don't go, blah, blah, blah. Actually, we don't go to church because we're full of it. That's why we don't go to church. Because we're full of us. Because we want to do what we want to do, thank you very much. And the church stands for something far higher than that. It stands for the changing of one's life. Oh, wait a minute. I've met a lot of Christians who's changed, whose lives weren't particularly well-ordered, who weren't changed. Me too. Ain't it a shame? But they didn't catch that disease in church, friends. They might have gotten raised wrong, but they didn't get church wrong. I've been through about as many church fights as you have. If you're not careful, I'll tell you that story, and you don't want to hear that one more time. But you don't give out the church. You don't throw it away. It's Christ's body in this world. Nobody, I am convinced, actually knows Jesus Christ in any meaningful way if they're not connected in some fashion with Christ's body in this world. You know, doing His bidding doing what he needs to be done in this world, being concerned about other people who love Christ and love his church. And so 
Saul comes to Christ. The early church through the person of Ananias is sent to him to raise him up out of death, to give his sight back to him, to give him direction. And so in that, in that, in that situation, I want you to take you to Acts 9 and verse 26. When Saul had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. You notice he attempted. He meant well, but they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe he was a disciple. <laughs> yeah, didn't believe it. But guess who? Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. But they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Wonderful. It never stays that way. <laughs> it never stays that way. Uh, there are those Sundays when I go home, um, late in the evening, and um, it's been a day where uh, people came to church and we didn't have as many empty chairs and there was a good spirit in the house and, and, uh, and uh, people listened to my message and didn't complain about how long it was. and You know, one of those kind of days. And uh, I'm on the way home and I'm thinking and Ruby and I are maybe thinking together, well, this was a great day. Look at this, what happened. Look at that, what happened. Isn't that great? And then, of course, I realize about halfway into that conversation, okay, you better watch it. <laughs> this was too good a day. <laughs> Something else may be coming, you know. And you know what? It always does. It always does. So the church is wonderful here in Acts 9, verse 31. I mean, they're walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the church is being multiplied and people are coming and it's a wonderful time. And it doesn't stay that way. It doesn't stay that way in your life either. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. But we're following the Lord in an unfriendly world. And one of the reasons it's unfriendly is because Satan has a tremendous power in this planet. And a whole lot of people have shipped out to him. A whole lot of people think money is God. A whole lot of people think you're expendable in their goals in life. Probably everybody who's ever worked for a living has come across those managers, don't you think? Yeah, me too. Me too. My goodness, I've come across pastors with that mindset. Shipped out to Satan, buddy. My career is everything. Money is the issue. Get out of my way. And so, I guess I'm putting Barnabas up in front of you because I want you to understand what an opposite number that man is. No wonder God could use him in the life of some superstars like Peter and in the life of Paul. No wonder God could use him. It wasn't always peaceful and it wasn't always wonderful. No. Go with me back to Acts chapter 12. Peter's in prison, but earnest prayer is made to God by the church. And the Lord wants to make sure that the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Barnabas are included in this prayer meeting. So in, verse, in Acts 12, verse 6, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, sentries before the door were guarding the prison, Behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side, woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands, 
And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. <laughs> Obviously, the angel was given instructions to make sure Peter puts his sandals on. He keeps forgetting those. <laughs> and, so, and so, get dressed. Got to help you out of bed. And so, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. He must also forget his cloak a lot. So, and he went and followed him. And he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. He thought he was having a dream, you know. And when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. I'm sure at this point Peter is saying, this is a wonderful dream. <laughs> I really like the way this is going. <laughs> I wonder if it's prophecy. <laughs> and the gate opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. So when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. In other words, this is not the famous Mary. This is someone you haven't met before, whose uh, son, John Mark, um, wrote the Gospel of Mark, um, and where many were gathered together and they were praying. You remember that, don't you? That they had met together for earnest prayer for Peter. And so, when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer, Rhoda will always be famous <laughs> for ignoring Peter. <laughs> and she was so tickled, she went into the group who was busy praying and said, He's at the door. And of course, you know the response. Recognizing Peter's voice and her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. I bet Rhoda was about 15 years old. What do you want to think? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. And they said to her, You're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. I think that was an ancient way of saying, oh no, he's dead. And this is his spirit at the door. I think that's what they were trying to say. Peter continued knocking, however. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then he departed and went to another place. Um, you understand the ministry of encouragement is upon the church. There isn't one person who's assigned the job of being the encourager in this church. You probably thought all this time it was me. Now, you know me better than that. I'm not a great encourager. I might kick you into encouragement, but I'm not a great encourager. That's not my job alone. It's yours. Encouragement is the job of the church. You wonder who has that spiritual gift? I'll tell you who has it. All of you all who are listening to my voice, you have that job. Don't you just hate sitting with people who are Christians and love the Lord and all they can do is complain? Don't you hate that? You know why you hate that? You know, you know why? It's not because they're not justified maybe in their complaints. I mean, people do hurt. People do grieve. People do get depressed. It's not like you got to be the clown for the party. That's not the issue. But every time we bump into Peter's in prison, what are we going to do? It's the job of those who love the Lord to pray. It's our job to be something we cannot normally be. And that is expectant of what God will move and do. You know what we call that, don't you? Faith. Faith. I'll tell you why we're down as much as we are. Because we're not doing what it takes to walk by the Spirit. Now, if this pokes you hard, receive it. 
receive it. Receive it. This isn't prophecy. This is telling you what God knows is true. If you're down all the time, kick yourself hard. Because what you are doing is you are pushing away the Spirit of God from what He can do in your life. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. You know, I, this has happened to me, and that's happened to me. I'm sure it has. And I may not recover. You may not. Stephen loved the Lord and served the Lord and was stoned to death. What kind of reward is that, do you think? I'll tell you what kind of reward that is. When he was busy dying, dying, bleeding to death, he could turn to a crowd of angry dogs who hated his guts because they were motivated by the demonic and say to the Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What did that mean? It meant that when he went into glory, friends, he got free. Nothing was on his back. No demon followed him to glory. And ultimately what took place out of his death, believe it or not, was the conversion of the man who had manufactured his death. Stephen's terrible, bloody death was what God used to bring the apostle Paul to faith. It pursued him until finally he gave up. It made sure, listen to me, that act of Saul the Jew made sure that he was going to become Paul the Apostle. That act. Nobody could have seen that on that day. The men who buried Stephen, my God, I'm sure what they did was grieve. So would you and I. I've grieved a lot of things, haven't you, over the years? My goodness. Not just the death of people around me or the death of my own family. I've grieved a lot of things. And you have too. You might say, I have every right to have gray hair. I have every right to be upset with life. I have every right to expect more of God than I got. I have every right. You don't have one single right to stand on, and you and I both know it. You have been ornery in your mind, at least, and in your actions, far beyond belief, and God knows it's true. And yet, He just keeps coming back with mercy and grace and forgiveness. My goodness, you'd be insane not to love the Lord God Almighty. Insane. I met a lot of insane people who don't love the Lord. Are they happy? Give me a break. Most miserable people on the face of the earth are people who refuse to know that the earth they're standing on was created by God Almighty. And so, Barnabas is one of those people who simply, though he was named Joseph, took on the ministry of encouragement. It's the ministry of the church. Paul needed it, certainly, didn't he? Now, on this day in Acts 12, Peter certainly needed it. He was just as shocked that he got released from prison as Rhoda was. And as the people who were praying at Mary and John Mark's house, how shocked they were that Peter could actually stand there in front of them in the middle of the night. I, I, have, I, got an, I have an excuse for them, I think. It, and that is that later in Acts chapter 12, Herod the king who had imprisoned Peter uh, gave a speech to some people who were uh, hoping to get something from him. And because they were hoping for something, as people often do, they applauded his speech. They thought it was a speech of God. And Luke records in Acts 12 that the Lord struck him down because, he says, God, he did not give God the glory. He was eaten by worms and breathed his last, but the word of God increased and multiplied. That's in Acts 12, and I'm in verse 24. And in, and in verse 25, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem where they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. 
boy, that's a whole other story. He wants us to know that, that Barnabas and Paul were in this ministry in Acts 12, pre, uh, praying for Peter. Let me tell you what can happen in the encouragement of the Lord. And by the way, if you keep looking for encouragement, it's hard to find. Kind of like if you keep looking for love, it's hard to find. You know how it always generates. You know this is true. You have to start encouraging somebody else. And lo and behold, you become encouraged. I know this is just too simple, but it is one of those spiritual realities. You start loving people, and God will bring love to you. People will start appreciating you if you will start appreciating other people, but you've got to do it first. Yes, you do. Uh, go with me in the Old Testament. This may be a challenge for you. The book of 1 Samuel. The book of 1 Samuel, chapter 23. And if you're wondering where it is, it's right in front of 2 Samuel. 1 Samuel, chapter 23. Um, David is having a terrible time because it's, it's, a, it's just interesting how, how God does things. Uh, Saul, the king, was not doing what God wanted him to do. He was following after his own fleshly desires. And God was looking for a man who could live by the Spirit, who could function in the way God wanted him to function. And so in that light, Saul decided that he wasn't going to give up the kingship, but God appointed the prophet Samuel. That's why we're in the book of 1 Samuel. Appointed the prophet Samuel to go and anoint David as the new king of Israel, even though King Saul was still on the throne, still on the, the crown. But... Samuel came and anointed David as king. And so the very next day, <clears throat> Saul uh, gave him the crown and said, What a guy. Love you a lot, David. I'll help any way I can. Uh, go serve the Lord better than I did. If you would believe that, you would have not read this story at all. Uh, Saul tried to kill David at every turn he could. Only God kept him from killing him. And in, and in 1 Samuel 23... David is hiding, 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 being pursued all the time by Saul. And in, uh, just start with me in verse 15. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. The story doesn't end there, of course, because <coughs> David has to flee repeatedly after this from Saul. But Jonathan told him what God was going to do. You know what Jonathan did, don't you? He strengthened his hand in God. That's an encourager. Maybe you don't have one. Maybe you don't have anybody who's encouraging you. I'm kind of unfortunate because in my household... All I have to do is start complaining. And my wife will read me a scripture verse. All I have to do is say, well, God isn't doing this. And she will remind me of the time that God did something. A year ago, or two years ago, or 25 years ago. And so, uh, it doesn't get very far in my house to say, I'm discouraged. Because then she sort of takes on the role of the preacher. And tells me how important it is to trust God and to believe Him and to have some faith. You know, she sort of takes on my job. That is my job. But encouragers need encouraging. Depressed people need encouraging. 
And so, you know, the, the difficulty that we have in our life is that we know God can do mighty things, wonderful things, miraculous things. And He does them every day. And we don't see them because we're busy complaining about life. We're busy stirring our own little pot, you know, like the witches at Macbeth, you know. We're sort of busy stirring up our own trouble. God won't do this for me because I'm not worthy. Well, honey, <laughs> if you're waiting for that day to come, you've got a long wait. You ain't never going to be worthy, ever. But God moves anyway. Peter had a long life in front of him, but he wasn't too sure of that. He thought it might be ending pretty fast. It ended for James. It ended for Stephen. What can Peter do about all that? Couldn't take the chains off. What he could do is put himself in God's hands. And the church took on the rest of the responsibility. With earnest prayer for him, they were praying to God for his release. And it worked. God worked. Look at your life. Is that the missing element? It's wonderful to trust God when things are going well. When you're feeling good. When there's enough money in the bank. This is simple. Those are easy times. I'm talking about the times when you're sitting with Peter in prison and you think you might be dying in the morning. Man alive. Most of us would be resenting the fact that we were even sitting there. Didn't God know we were saying? Because people would do this all the time. Didn't God know that this was coming? How were, I'm so worthy of God's help. Why am I in this place? Why have God done this to me? And of course, God hadn't done it to Peter. It was Herod. Let me go back to Acts 12 for just a minute and tell you. God had planned the death of Herod the king. God even had determined out of his judgments that the soldiers who had, who had put Peter in prison were going to die by Herod's hand. You may not like that, and it doesn't matter. It was how it was going to turn out. Because you mess with Peter... And you are walking dead man. You mess with the church, friends. And it's all over. Except for your repentance. You cuss preachers. And I can tell you now. <laughs> I can tell you now. You are on dangerous territory. You act like you're right and everybody in the church is wrong. And I'm going to tell you now. Boy, are you wrong. Doesn't matter how they treated you. Doesn't matter what they said to you. Watch your mouth. Watch what you're doing. Watch your attitude. Because God's listening. He has a plan. The reason that the people who gathered in Mary and John Mark's house were not told, you can quit praying now. Peter's out of jail. He's coming over now. In a minute, he'll be knocking on the door. By the way, somebody, please tell Rhoda that Peter's coming to the door. Would you tell that to her? Bless her heart. Nobody heard that message because the Spirit of God wasn't saying to Paul and Barnabas and other people who were spiritual giants, you can quit praying now because that wasn't the plan. Do you know why they were still praying when Peter showed up at the door? Because the job wasn't over yet. Were they praying for Peter to get out of prison? Yes, he got out of prison. Well, okay, now we can all go home and have bologna sandwiches. Nope, nope. Still praying, still fasting, still gathered, surprised by Peter coming because that was only the first step they were praying about. What they didn't know is they were praying for the complete destruction of Herod and his company. And that's what happened. This included in this chapter, even though Herod died several years after Peter was released from prison. But it's in, and, and even after that event of Herod's death, you find Luke includes 
Barnabas and Saul returned 